Glory to Jesus Christ. I'm Father Thomas Loya. I'm pastor of Annunciation Byzantine Catholic Parish here in Homer Glen, Illinois. It's a uh, suburb in the Chicago, the greater Chicago area. And our church, Annunciation Church, will be the setting for our message on iconography and liturgy and worship. But not only that, also about life. If I can emphasize anything in this presentation, it's the word integration of how ingeniously integrated the art, the architecture, the liturgy, the text, the gesture, everything is in worship, especially in the Eastern churches. It's very ingeniously integrated. And icons need to be seen not so much as a separate entity of themselves. Yes, they, they can be that. You can have an icon, you know, someone paints an icon to use in worship. Yes, absolutely. However, the greater understanding of iconography is set in the context of liturgy, and the architecture of the whole church, ingeniously integrated. So we start from the outside to get the biggest picture and work all the way to the smallest point. In the big picture, starting from the outside, we see that Eastern churches have certain architectural motifs, and it's based upon the theology. See, in Eastern churches, especially with iconography, we express everything we believe. Everything is very purposeful in the way we design it and present it, so that we're presenting what we believe. The important concept here is participation in something, immersion in something, into this mystery of the Holy Trinity. In the Eastern churches, you often see the motifs of arches and domes, and the reason for that is, the starting point for the Eastern churches is that God's utter transcendence, His holy otherness, that He is so beyond us, so great, so out there, way into the heavens, ineffable, incomprehensible, as our prayers say. Again, see me integrate the prayer and the architecture. But watch my hands. The God who is so out there has also, as we say in the Eastern churches, has bent the heavens, has come down, has condescended, emptied himself, the great kenosis, to enter into his own creation. So we have the motif of this shape, in other words, a dome, to express the heavens bowing down. But that dome coming to earth is intersecting with earth. Earth in the Eastern churches and the architecture is often expressed in terms of the four corners of the world, north, south, east, and west, even though the earth is round, it's the four corners. So we use a perfect cube, four equal sides. We intersect the dome motif with the cube, and what you get is the kind of style that you often see in Eastern churches. And all that is saying that heaven has connected has united with earth and that is essential that's going to be essential theme for everything especially in icons down to the last detail the whole point the whole message of art iconography and liturgy is that we here on earth participate in the heavenly liturgy in heaven heaven and earth have united because of the incarnation of christ and that is the fundamental mystery the great mystery hidden from all ages now revealed and expressed in the art, iconography, liturgy of the church. On the outside of the church, you get a hint of what is going to be inside. So you oftentimes get icon murals on the outside, as you see here on this church at Annunciation. You see the dome, the Slavic dome. It took the Greek dome, sort of the bowl-like dome, and it uh, formed it into a sort of a Slavic dome for a lot of reasons has a number of symbolisms to it, also practicality, keeps snow off the roof and so on. But along with the domes comes also art shapes and they have icons in them. The icons give you a hint of what is to occur inside the church, but just kind of a hint. Also, putting icons on the outside of a church has a very similar effect as the gargoyles, for instance, in the Gothic architecture of the medieval churches in the West. It's believed to keep away evil forces, and indeed they do. Iconography has the power to keep away evil and keep us rooted in that incarnational sacramental vision. We put icons everywhere. For instance, right here, this thing here, this is a mailbox. <laughs> it's got icons on all four sides. If there's a surface, we're gonna put an icon on it because it reveals what we believe. Imagine something this size just for something this size. 
See, in the Eastern churches, if it's worth doing, it's worth overdoing. That's why our prayers are long. Our services are considered to be long by modern standards because we're constantly groping for yet another way to express this ineffable, inexpressible God. He always remains beyond us and we keep trying to express it through more icons, more imagery, more words of a prayer. And so in a sense, we kind of overdo things because God himself is like, almost overdone. He's incomprehensible. He's lavish. And we express that fundamental belief through everything we do. All right, we started from the outside, from the big picture, from the architecture and motifs. Remember, heaven and earth unite. That's the important thing. That's the context in which icons are going to be seen in the context of a liturgy. Now we're going to go inside. Okay, we've stepped now inside the first zone of the church. See, the church architecturally is zoned. It goes all the way back to the design of the Old Testament temple. The first set of doors takes us into what we call the vestibule. Now we're in the narthex. And you see from the deistic icon right here, above this very favorite couch here, the kind of our gathering area, you see yet another icon, another hint of what is to come. Now let's go into the nave of the church. As we enter the nave of the church, perhaps you're saying, wow, look at that, wow. At least I hope you are. That's precisely what the art and architecture, the liturgy wants you to say. That's the exact reaction that the liturgy, the icons want you to have. As you enter into the nave, you notice that there's like an explosion of visual imagery Imagery and a sense, an atmosphere, an environment that is unlike anything else anywhere. Because what you're doing is you're, you're coming into what is attempted to be a sense of heaven on earth. As if you're walking into the very place where the angels and saints are and they're very present through the art, the iconography, the architecture of the church. Because the liturgy that takes place here, the worship that takes place here, is a, in fact a participation in the heavenly liturgy. See, during liturgy, and only through liturgy and prayer, especially the liturgy, and most especially through the Eucharistic liturgy, do we actually have, in a sense, one foot in this earth and one foot actually in the next life. We actually do take our place along the angels in the heavenly liturgy that is happening in heaven, and that it takes place especially during the Eucharistic liturgy. The architecture of the church, and remember we said earlier, the intersection of domes and, and, and the cube creates certain areas called pendentives. These are in the corner of the church, you see they have on them the icons of the four evangelists. The iconography in the church is so wedded with the architecture that the architecture was made or designed almost as though it was for the icons, as if the architect had the icons in mind first and then designed the church around the icons. That's how perfectly wedded the art and architecture is in the Eastern churches. Very, very, very purposeful, very, very integrated. As we saw at the very highest point, the icon of the Christ Pantocrator, there he is, the largest figure in the church. In fact, the importance of the figures in the icons are reflected in their size and also their prominence, their placement in the architecture. Here we've got Christ Pantocrator, the all-powerful ruler looming over you as you walk in, almost knocking you to your, to your feet, to the floor in its awesomeness. God is awesome, incomprehensible, ineffable, and so we make him huge and encompassing in the central dome of the church. As you look at the Pantocrator, though, you see this awesome, almost scary thing. It's a reverential awe. It's not a psychological fear. It's a reverential awe. At the same time, you look at the face, and you see in the face and the eyes a great, great compassion. Once again, in iconography, as with the liturgy of the church, we live in the both and. 
things are this way and that way all at the same time. The icons are going to reflect that. The architecture is going to reflect that. It's going to be heaven and earth, not heaven or earth, heaven and earth. And we exist in the confluence of those complementary realities. Around Christ are the angels, because the entire ceiling that sort of knocks you off your feet, or should as you walk in the church, the entire ceiling is one icon, one complete icon of the heavenly liturgy. Notice the angels have in their hands instruments, instruments that are used in the liturgy that we actually celebrate as human beings here on earth in the church. The idea being is that it's almost like mirrors, like what is up in the, in the ceiling is mirroring what's happening here on the earthly floor of the church and vice versa. The angels carry in their hands every item that we used in the liturgy itself. What this is depicting is the reality that the liturgy that we enter into is indeed a participation of the heavenly liturgy. We mystically take our place alongside the angels in the ongoing liturgy in heaven. In fact, again, the texts of the liturgy match the iconography, the architecture, and the rhythm of the liturgy, because we sing, let us who mystically represent the cherubim, sing the thrice holy hint of the life creating trinity, now set aside all earthly cares. So we literally say what the icons are depicting and the reality that is happening to us as we are entering the church and entering into the liturgy. The next most important icons, and again we go in terms of the size and the placement of the icons, is going to be the one here in the sanctuary of the church. Then we'll come back into the nave. We're going to move into the sanctuary now, and we're going to take a peek at the icon, you see it through the royal doors of the icon screen here, you're going to see the icon of the platitera. It means more spacious than the heavens. This is the second most important icon. The third most important, of course, were the evangelists, which you saw in the pendentives. The icon of the platitera means more spacious than the heavens. He, Jesus, whom not even the universe can contain, was contained within the womb of a virgin, making her more spacious than the heavens, and therefore a mystical tabernacle. This is why this icon is painted in that privileged place, that privileged place in the Holy of Holies, the nuptial spousal chamber where Christ the bridegroom will meet his bride in the intimacy of the Eucharist. There she is presenting Christ to us as though we're looking into the deepest part of her, her soul, her heart, her womb. And therefore, because Christ is within her, she becomes the mystical tabernacle. Beneath that icon on the altar is the actual tabernacle itself with the consecrated bread in reserve. In other words, the actual real presence, the body of Christ in the tabernacle. So a tabernacle on the altar and the mystical human tabernacle hovering above. So you see how it's all extremely integrated. Now before we go to other icons, you can look at another feature in the architecture of the church, an essential feature. This is the icon screen, or kind of stasis. This is a very essential item. And as I mentioned before, and the one thing we have to always remember, that liturgy through the art and architecture the text, the gesture, everything, is not only our participation in the mystery of the Trinity, in the heavenly liturgy, liturgy also gives us the blueprint for life on earth, sort of the how-to, the manual of what life is about. Because you see, liturgy informs all of life, and life informs liturgy. Everything moves in and out of liturgy. Liturgy is the center of everything. And therefore, it gives us that blueprint on the order of creation and how we're supposed to live on the deep principles of life. And one of those examples, a, a wonderful example, is the icon screen. The icon screen divides the nave from the Holy of Holies. And because it's very elaborate, very solid, and oftentimes there's a curtain behind it, it blocks our view into the sanctuary. It blocks our way into the sanctuary. Because you see, behind and beyond that icon screen 
is the Holy of Holies, uh, heaven. And we have not entered heaven yet. If you've been to heaven, let us know. But we, we're not there yet, but we're en route. So it tells us you can't go up there. Not only can none of us really go up there, but the only one person that can go beyond this icon screen is the one who is authorized to do so, just like in the Old Testament, the priest. In the Old Testament is the high priest. Here it's the priest, the bishop, the ordained ministers. And they go here only when they are correctly and fully vested, especially through the middle doors or world doors. So the Holy of Holies is reserved for the holiest things and for only those who are authorized by their office, not because they're personally better than you, but because of the office of priesthood. The icon screen conceals or blocks our way. A lot of people say, well, I can't see the priest back there. Well, good, you're not supposed to, at least not all the time. There are times when you will see the priest, but not always. Although it blocks your way, it does something else. And here we come again to the both and reality, the complementarity and the meaning of the two. It also reveals. It conceals, blocks, and reveals. It reveals by means of the icons that are on the icon screen. And notice how they are situated, as icons always are. They're very frontal. What this is saying is that those who are in heaven, as if they're coming from heaven, symbolized by the Holy of Holies, the sanctuary, they're coming from heaven towards you so that you get the sense now that we're not in heaven yet, and, but because the incarnation, remember that, just like with the architecture, the incarnation has brought heaven to earth. So heaven has touched earth. We do have a taste, a certain entrance to heaven. It's just that it's not complete yet. Now, why is this so important? First of all, it gives us the most fundamental orientation, the correct orientation of our entire spirituality, what life is about, how we are en route to God. That is where we're headed. We face east, ad orientum. We face east. We're on our en route to God, to heaven, but we're not there yet. We kind of live in that tension. Life is living in that tension where you, you know we feel in our hearts. God put into our souls, our hearts, that desire, that awareness of what is true, good, and beautiful. But yet, we're not there yet. And so we kind of long for that. We have this tension, so we keep striving. But also, the icon screen presents to us a beautiful, wonderful, essential principle of psycho-spiritual health of life. Yes, it's right here. It's in the doors. The fact that there are doors on the icon screen. Deacon doors, the server doors, and of course the Holy of Holies for the ordained ministers. Now why this is essential is because it gives us the principle of healthy boundaries. Healthy boundaries are essential for healthy and holy psycho-spiritual existence. Healthy boundaries work this way. This icon screen sets a boundary to what is holy. It tells us that we don't go there unless you're authorized. There is something greater than we are that we defer to. That's very important because we live in a time when we think we're entitled to everything. We live in a time of tremendous arrogance where we don't really look at anything that has authority as being really greater than we are. It's up to our opinion, our feelings, what we think we believe. Very bad spirituality. Causes a lot of problems today. In the liturgy, though, in the church, in the icon screen, we get the correct view that, no, there are things that are greater than we are. We're not yet worthy or authorized to enter into. So there's a boundary. But healthy boundaries are not just closed solid, nor are they completely open. If this icon screen wasn't here, that would not be a healthy situation liturgically. It would not give us the correct view of life. What is correct is a boundary that also has doors or gates on it. But the gates, the doors, open largely from the inside. They're controlled from the inside, not from outside. People don't barge in. They don't feel entitled to enter as they please. They only go in if they're authorized or invited. And that is the same principle that is used 
in good psychological health, health in spiritual health. It's especially true when it comes to relationships like marriage and so on. It also helps to prevent abuse. See, a lot of abuse of all kinds that we have between human beings comes from a lack of healthy boundaries. Abuse happens when boundaries are transgressed. You don't belong there in that space of that person. At the same time, we don't fence people out totally. So the icon screen gives us that blueprint of healthy boundaries, an essential principle for good health today as a person. And also the understanding that we are en route to heaven, but we're not there yet. See, we have to live in this tension, this tension of two complementary realities that come together. You don't try to figure them out. That's why we love mystery in the Eastern churches. Icons, the icon screen, everything. This is all dedicated to giving us a sense of mystery. It's something that makes us go, wow, you know, I, I understand a lot of this, but some of it I don't understand. It's like really tangible for me, yet beyond me. And we live right in that tension. And icons are designed that way, in the way they're painted, the colors of composition, and so on. A little bit more about the icon screen, because it's so essential, absolutely essential. The icon screen basically is divided in sections. The right side, you see the main icon there is of Jesus Christ. Above him are some smaller icons that have to do with the feast days of Jesus Christ. We call them the, the holy days events in, the, in his life, you know, his birth, his presentation in the temple, the baptism, and so on. Above that tier are different prophets and saints. You also see the peacock. A lot of people ask about that. The peacock represents an ancient Byzantine symbol for immortal life. There can be any number of tiers on an icon screen. It can even be just the one tier with the main icons. But this side represents Christ, and over on the far right, we have an icon that could be of various choices. Here it's the icon of the protection of the Mother of God. And you see her mantle being spread over what is an image of this church, Annunciation Church, as though she were protecting us because we are named under her patronage of the Annunciation. Now if we go then to the other side of the icon screen, this is the side of the Virgin Mary. Here you have the Virgin Mary and above her feast days from her life, such as the, the, the Dormition, and her, again her protection, her being presented into the, into the temple, and again above her more prophets and saints, the peacock, and at the very top of the icon screen is the deesis, Christ flanked by the two most perfect people other than himself on earth. Of course, Christ was God and man. He was a person and divine. He was uh, had two natures, of divine and human. On either side of him then are the two greatest human beings, John the Baptist and, of course, his Blessed Mother. Just below that is the icon of the Mystical Supper. It's known in the West as Last Supper. We call it Mystical Supper, again, because mystical, we love that word mystical. The icons are mystical. The liturgy is mystical because mystical means what is most real. It means the ultimate meaning of something, what something ultimately points to. It's not just what's here. Yes, it was the Last Supper, in a sense, but it was actually a, a new beginning, a supper that began something, a supper that entered them into the mystical reality of Christ's very body. When Christ took bread and wine, the physicality of bread and wine, and he said, this will become my body and blood, that ushered in a new mystical meaning of this bread and wine of how Christ would be present to us. So we call it the mystical supper. The middle doors are, as I mentioned, are the doors of the, we call it the royal doors, or the, the holy doors. There, in and out of those doors, come the ordained ministers, and usually only when they're vested properly, especially fully vested during the Eucharist. Now, we're going to look at uh, some other icons in the nave here. And also the tabernacle and the Holy of Holies. So back in the nave, as we look at some of the other major icons, we see 
above the arch, if you look up now, above the arch that arches over the beginning of the sanctuary, we see an icon of the Holy Trinity based on Genesis chapter 18, also called the hospitality of Abraham. There, it's in a very central place, as you can see, so it has to be important, has to be prominent. Why is it so prominent? Because the Holy Trinity is everything for us. To understand God as three persons makes all the difference in the world. A union and community of persons in love, in perfect love. The foundation for understanding of marriage and family life. The three angels represent the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, moving from left to right, gathered around a table, reminiscent of the Eucharistic banquet, but also of the Passover, which of course was a foreshadowing of the Eucharistic banquet. On either side is Abraham and Sarah, who offered hospitality to the three angels, and this was a foreshadowing in the Old Testament of the Holy Trinity. So there you have, in a very prominent place, above the very Holy of Holies, this icon of the Trinity. In iconography, we cannot paint God the Father or the Holy Spirit, although sometimes it has happened, but that was a later, a later adaptation, especially in some of the Russian icons. But basically in iconography, we don't paint God the Father or the Holy Spirit, because neither one was really incarnate, as was the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ. So the artist, the church, the iconographers, had a challenge. How do we depict the Trinity without transgressing the theology? So they came up with this brilliant idea of the three angels in the Old Testament that were foreshadowing God as three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Eastern churches and our liturgy, very, very Trinitarian conscious. So what do we have? We have an icon of the Trinity in a very prominent place. Just below that icon, is an icon of the ascension of our Lord. Again, in a very prominent place, very large icon, because here in the liturgy, especially as we approach what happens in the Holy of Holies, we have the ultimate connection, the ultimate participation, immersion of the invisible heavenly world with the visible. Jesus Christ is ascending to glory, showing his divinity, ascending to heaven, to the throne of heaven, Yet, he does so taking with him the very human nature he had on earth, which means that humanity has been destined by God with such a marvelous destiny to sit on the very throne of heaven with him. You see the angels pointing upward, the apostles all excited in, in ab absolute disbelief of such a marvelous miracle. In iconography, there's always, and again, here we come to a principle of complementary realities converging, there's always going to be what we call a narrative and a hieratic dimension. You can see this in the icon of the ascension. Christ is very vertical, very staid, very straight. That's called hieratic. In other words, as if he's not moving because God is perfect. He doesn't need moving, doesn't need to develop, to transition, to divinize as we do. We are in constant movement, constant, being constantly en route to our perfection. And so in the narrative part, with the part that's on the earth of the apostles, you see lots of movement there, lots of excitement, lots of pointing, lots of hands up in dismay and, and, and in awe. And you'll see that in many, many icons. In fact, there's a very good representation of that here in the icon of the transfiguration of our Lord on Mount Tabor. Now, this is on the north wall of this church where we have other, what I call, narrative historical icons. In other words, icons that depict events in the life of Christ while on earth. There you see a marvelous example of the fusion of heaven and earth because you see the apostles are falling flat on their faces because what they're, what they're seeing is causing them to be overcome by what they're seeing. They're seeing two things, again, two converging realities. They're seeing Jesus Christ transfigured on Mount Tabor, and he is showing his divinity, the glory of his divinity as God, but he's also showing, at the same time, the glory of what it truly means to be human. Because in Christ, we see, he is the new Adam, we see in him 
our original, the original intention God had for us before sin, that we would be glorious, beautiful human beings, perfect and radiant like Adam and Eve were before sin, but also our destiny to have our bodies and souls reunited, gloriously transfigured in heaven with Christ. So the meaning, the real meaning of our being human, being made in the image and likeness of God, as the book of Genesis says, is seen here in the transfiguration of Christ. The apostles see that for the first time and they fall flat on their face. So here you have again the hieratic. See how vertical, straight, kind of motionless Christ is in the center. Very strong vertical. Look at all the action there in the apostles falling down at these extreme angles and so on, covering their faces. Lots of drama there on, in the earthly part of the icon. The upper half, of course, is the hieratic. On either side of Christ is Elijah and Moses. They appeared to him and were conversing with Christ because they represent the two aspects of the Old Testament before Christ, the law and the prophets. And this became fulfilled in Christ. So there he is speaking with Moses and Elijah, and he is flanked by them on either side of him while the apostles fall back in utter dismay. Another feature of the church, and we'll go away from the icons for a moment, is the chandelier, the lighting here. Light, Christ, the true light who comes into the world. We say this during the Vesper service, during the liturgy. So again, the text that we say is consistent with the icons, which are then consistent with the architecture, which is consistent with the gesture. We take on the same gesture in liturgy as you see in the icons, that deferential posture of like the heads bow, the hands like this. Even in the vestments of the priest, what we wear, notice that so much of our body is covered, even our hands. It's the same thing with the vestments. The vestments are cut very, very low so as to cover our hands. Why? That is signifying deference, that we are in the presence of something so great that we even cover ourselves because we're not worthy. Not that we're shameful or bad. It's just that it's a sense of humility, of deference, that we basically, we're turning the stage over to the star of the show, Christ. In fact, you see a great example of that in this icon here of Christ, uh, Christ theophany, his baptism. Look at the angels, how their hands are covered. They are bent and bowed in deference to Christ. Their faces are just so so contemplative, so taking in this mystery of Christ, almost, almost with consternation. They, they, can't, they can't behold, even, even they as angels cannot behold how God himself in the person of Christ would descend into the lowest part of the earth's surface and be baptized, something that is reserved for sinners. The angels themselves are in awe. And there you see John the Baptist. His hand is on top of Jesus Christ symbolizing the imposition of hands, which is always a process of a prophetic office, some kind of office being transferred, just like with the ordination to the priesthood or the episcopacy. John is transferring his prophetic office to Jesus as he will pick up that same theme, reform your lives. He will be a prophet, but of course the Messiah. He descends into the waters of the Jordan, and in doing so, takes human nature with him. He drowns the old and rises up with the new. He cleanses human nature, and also by entering the water, since he is God, he cleanses water. He sanctifies water by his very presence. And he has picked that lowest part on the earth's surface. He descends. There is no limit to the self-emptying, to the condescension of God for us in, out of his love for us. He will descend one more time, even deeper, and that icon is on the south wall of this church, Christ will descend even deeper into Hades. Here we have the icon, sometimes called the icon of the resurrection, it's really the, called the harrowing of hell, where Jesus Christ descends into hell to break the bonds of hell. He goes into the depths of the abyss. He cannot go any lower. He went as low as he could on earth to be baptized for us. Then he descends even further to the lowest depths of Hades to do battle with the devil and break his power. There he is smashing the gates of hell which fall into the form of a cross and the locks and the hinges busting apart 
and there he takes Adam and Eve, symbolic of all humanity, out of sarcophagi. In other words, in a sense, he's raising everyone from Hades, from death, from not being able to be in heaven with him. He raises them up and takes them to heaven with him. On either side of him are all those great and righteous people of the Old and the New Testament. They're symbolized and represented by these few figures here, like King David and, and Solomon and so on, and Isaiah. They represent all those righteous people who could not fully be in heaven until Christ paid the ransom, descended into the depths of hell, and broke the power of Satan. So the beliefs that we have are depicted in the icons so that we come into church and we look at these icons. We're immersed in our faith. We're immersed in the Bible. We just don't read the Bible. We walk into the Bible by virtue of the icons. And while we're in the liturgy, we are saying the words that come from the Bible. So much of the liturgy is, is the actual quotation or paraphrasing from the scripture, from like the Psalms. And that they're like strung together and that makes up most of our liturgical text. So you see, we've got Bible. We've got the life of Christ, the saints, the events of Christ, the salvific events, the great condescension. We've got the art, the architecture, the icons, how they're designed, how they're made, the, the hieratic and the narrative. We've got all these things, the gesture, our own, the gesture, seeing the angels, our gesture in the liturgy of the bowing, the prostrating, the signing of the cross, the repeating of the Trinity over and over again. It's all integrated into one entire participation in the great mystery. And this is necessary because as human beings, we have five senses. God gave us five senses so that we could see the icons. We could see God. We could see the heaven reality coming through the icons. And indeed it does. We could hear, hear the angelic voices. We can, in the singing of the church that we align ourselves with as though we were hearing the angels in heaven. We taste things. We touch things. We feel things. We, we use all of our senses, our entire being, so that our physical and spiritual composition is immersed together in an integrated experience of God. And it's necessary that we have these things. We can't just think about God. God is not just in our heart or in our head. God is something we immerse ourselves in, the mystery of the Trinity. And that's why we need a body. We need the senses. We need our soul. We need our whole integrated being to be immersed in an integrated experience of God. The icons, the architecture, gives us the blueprint of life, the secrets of life. It immerses us in this mystery of God incarnating himself in his own cosmos, his own created order, and sanctifying it, and giving us the way to see. This is, in fact, what our faith is about. And liturgy and the iconography communicates that. Our faith is not about a bunch of rules and teachings or out of date, like a lot of people say today, but don't understand our faith. Our faith is about seeing. Seeing is, is a visual thing. And icons help us to see. They help us to see the very reality that we proclaim, that we believe, that we immerse ourselves into. They help us to see the true blueprint of life, the, the arrangement of the principles of life, the whole cosmos, the whole rhythm of life. And in fact, liturgy itself immerses us in a rhythm of life. We have a rising action, a climactic moment, then a falling action, a resolution, and the whole image, the whole rhythm recycles again and again. And the icons, the architecture, help that rhythm to, to happen. We immerse ourselves in that same rhythm. The important thing is to remember that every detail is purposeful. It's all integrated. And it immerses us in that incarnational reality. And therefore, it gives us the blueprint of life. How to see human beings. What life is about. What marriage and family is about. Man and woman. What the environment is about. God has entered into his own environment. Therefore, sanctifying it. You don't have to be an environmentalist to be good to the environment. You just have to see sacramentally. You have to see through the vision of the icon. The icon gives us the blueprint for life. And the icon set in the context of liturgy immerses us in the ultimate meaning of life here on earth and where our ultimate destiny will be forever.
Glory to Jesus Christ.